Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 100 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm a past member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, and currently I serve on the MS Society's Community Review of MS Research Committee. I'm a district activist leader and trustee for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to give us a place for the MS community to connect and to connect you with experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. Please feel free to post your comments and questions on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch. MS Navigators are online throughout today's program, answering those questions and connecting you to resources. MS can impact your ability to perform day-to-day -day tasks and be productive. It can even affect how you're able to move around in your own home. And while you don't have control over your MS, you do have control over your environment. Whether you're looking for a new place to live or you want to maintain living independently in your current home, there are professionals who can help you understand options like home modifications, technology and accessibility features, all designed to make it easier for you to live safely and comfortably in your home. Joining us with strategies for making your home safe and more accessible is Tracy Carrasco, an occupational therapist at Orlando Health's Multiple Sclerosis Comprehensive Care Center. Welcome, Tracy. Thanks for being with us today. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me. When I introduced you, I mentioned that you were an occupational therapist. And when people hear that term, they sometimes think that the work you do must be related to their job somehow. Right. Can you explain <laughs> what an occupational therapist does and how your work can benefit someone who's living with MS? Right. So I do get asked that a lot, um, and I probably have to explain it daily. Um, what we're doing, what I do as the OT is I'm looking to um, help people who may be disabled or injured become as independent and po as possible in their environment. Um, and we also always try and think about what the patient really wants to do or um, is, is uh, required to do or is interested in, in doing um, and how we can make that happen. So we can do utilize different strategies or tactics to help them, or we can think about maybe equipment or changing the environment they're doing a task in. Which other members of someone's MS healthcare team does an occupational therapist regularly work with? Well, you mentioned that I work at a comprehensive care center, so I'm really lucky. I work with the rest of my rehab team, which involves, uh, which has physical therapy and speech therapy. And then we work closely with the neurologist and the nursing um, and the MAs in the clinic. We have a social worker as well, so um, it's a rather comprehensive team. And then we have also other resources which are in the hospital system that we can refer to, such as uh, respiratory or dietary, um, or um, if there are vendors in the community that might help us with bracing or splinting um, or wheelchairs or other mobility devices too. I think sometimes it's a question for many people as to when to ask for some help. So I'm wondering, should someone who's living with MS who may be experiencing minimal mobility issues, should they start considering occupational therapy? We really do want to bring them in, not just to the occupational therapist, but the whole team um, of rehab. And we really like to get them in pretty early after diagnosis. And that's, that gives them all the education and information um, that they may need as well as um, establishing a good home program to um, think about wellness behaviors and exercise so that they can maximize their independence throughout the diagnosis. And it also gives them a nice connection. So if anything does 
occur um, that's not normal to them or they have a new symptom develop, then they can always come back to us and we're familiar, become, become kind of like a family. You know, we heard from Angela, who tells us that she's in her 50s and she's lived with MS for about 15 years. Angela has started seeing a decline in her hand dexterity. She's struggling to put on clothes that have buttons, zippers, or clasps, and she's experiencing foot drop more frequently. Angela's goal, she tells us, is to continue living independently for as long as possible, but she's not sure where or how to start addressing these changes in her physical status. So would occupational therapy benefit someone like Angela? Most definitely, yes. Um, I would probably say that both occupational and physical therapy could address, physical therapy would address more of the mobility issues as far as maybe bracing or um, a device potentially um, needed to help them get around more easily or her around. Um, but I would focus on things that are affecting her independence as far as her daily activities. Of, you mentioned dressing skills, um, uh, any of those things that she needs to do around her home every day. We want to make sure that she's independent and she's safe. So um, in the clinic, I could address the coordination issues. And we definitely start by doing some baseline testing to see where she's at and what kinds of issues she's having. Um, oftentimes people will, will come in and say, I think my hands are getting weaker. I can't tie my shoes um, or I keep dropping things. And then as we do a full assessment, we may find out, oh, there's some sensory issues going on or it's not the hand strength. It really is truly a motor, motor control issue. So those are treated differently, um, but we would have a custom plan to be able to help her improve that. And then of course, if um, need be, we can give her some assistive devices um, and let her trial them in the clinic, um, such as button, button hook aid or uh, changing the way she ties her shoes, um, little things like that. And then beyond that, we can go into the home environment and look at bigger, bigger picture, what could make her more safe with her mobility in her environment. So that's where equipment um, or changing the way she has her things set up at home, her furniture um, or her bathroom to make things easier. Well, speaking of that home environment, Handy tells us that she has a combination shower and bathtub mm -hmm. and she feels unstable stepping into and out of the bathtub and while she's taking a shower. Now, bathrooms are, are a common place for at-home falls and accidents to happen. So it's important that Candy addresses this. What tools are available to help with balance in the shower and what other modifications can be made in the bathroom? Yes, again, a really common issue, um, and you're correct, um, very frequently falls occur in the bathroom. So um, we first would, would start out um, addressing what, what she has set up. You mentioned a tub or shower. So we would, um, look into potential equipment that could help her without having to do a whole new bathroom modification. However, in an outpatient setting, I might ask them to bring in pictures for me um, to see if we can kind of problem solve that just from a distance. There are different types of um, bathroom uh, seats or uh, benches that are available so that she could get in and out of her bathtub independently. Grab bars are also really useful. Um, and then the question also becomes, is this a rental home or um, is a permanent home? Are we able to make permanent modifications to the home too? Because sometimes that's important um, to our, our patients. Maybe they're, they're concerned with resale value. And so we want to make sure that we pick something that fits their needs and improves their safety as well. Um, as far as doing more in-depth modifications, that's when maybe um, we, we can come out as an outpatient therapist, I can come out into the community and do something called a home modification. That's where I would go in and do a detailed measurements um, and be able to bring equipment or talk to people about modifications that could be made specifically for their home. Um, or we might even consider sending home health therapists who could work with a patient over 
several visits to try and see what would be the best options for them, whether it be equipment or an extensive modification. So um, lots of questions and it's really customized to each patient. Greg recently experienced a relapse that has affected his vision. He says he's not seeing things as clearly as he used to. And while he was at home, he recently tripped on a pillow because it blended right into the carpet. What steps can Greg take to maintain his independence and stay safe while he's at home? That That is definitely um, a home modification uh, because everything in his environment is going to affect him if he's not seeing it as clearly as he used to. Um, we like to look o- over the area. Uh, very frequent um, falls risks are things like throw rugs or like you mentioned, items that blend in um, to the floor or coloring. So. Um, we can help with things um, as far as explaining and educating on contrast of colors, um, perhaps look into improving the lighting in a home, decluttering the home so there's not as many uh, chances uh, of falls if there's nothing in the way to, to go to, to trip over. Um, again, we can do that as a home evaluation. A home, home therapist can do a great job with that as well to go in and kind of look at the environment. We heard from Roberto, who tells us he works from home, he uses a walker to get around, and he often gets fatigued moving from his bedroom and office upstairs down to his kitchen downstairs and then back again. (laughs) Roberto recently panicked when he left the oven on and then found that he was just too exhausted to walk back downstairs to turn it off. What options does Roberto have to make his home easier to maneuver in and Are there any technology-based tools that can help him avoid problems like the one he experienced with his oven? So uh, we have this question a lot about stairs in general, and I know it's not always possible, but the first thing that we might discuss is actually seeing if his office or bedroom could be moved to one single story so that we eliminate having to do the whole up and down the stairs, which could be very fatiguing, and then puts him at a higher risk to fall. Um, Other things, though, are uh, talking about energy conservation with them and and talking about um, uh, maybe having everything in one room so that he doesn't have to go up and down the stairs often. And you mentioned technology. So um, a a really good resource for that is using the uh, home assistants, for instance, like a Google or an Alexa. Um, Or you can just use apps on your phone. Um, Many appliances and different things around your house can be controlled uh, through uh, electron, electronic devices. Um, So he could actually tell his Google Assistant or his or his Alexa to turn off the oven. Um, uh, Another thing, he could have all of his appliances kind of wrapped up into an app and be able to turn that off. Um, I'll say that that actually did happen to me. My uh, freezer. contacted me when I was on a cruise ship leaving Miami, <laughs> told me that the temperature was raising. So I was able to call, call my neighbor and say, hey, can you stop by the house and see if I left it open? And sure enough, I left the door open. So um, they can be really handy and they'll contact you. They'll help you out. Um, very, very nice. And they never call in sick either. So they're <laughs> no. always on the job. <laughs> right. <laughs> We heard from Philip, who wants to know whether there's any technology that can help his wife who has MS and struggles with cognition. What services or products are available to help Philip's wife take notes or provide her with reminders while she's at home during the day? Wonderful, yes. Um, so just just to be clear, in our clinic, um, we have an occupational therapist, myself. I have a speech therapist who also works with cognitive skills and myself. Um, and also neuropsychology. Um, Neuropsychologists treat them as well. Um, What I would work on is a lot of exactly what you mentioned. How can we be safer in the home? How can we be independent? Um, Again, a lot of electronic devices and really just your smartphones can be a huge help. Um, Sometimes uh, people are afraid of technology and so they might be able to come into our clinic and we can help set them up. Um, Setting up things, for instance, teaching them how to use the calendar and reminder app on their phone. Um, They can set alarms or alerts for themselves. 
Um, and that truly with cognition and someone's daily activities, it really needs to be customized to them. Um, some people love the technology. Some people would rather stick with paper, pen and paper, and that's okay too. And I have plenty of people who use combinations of both. So we can help set up um, a scheduling system and, and use those different devices to help remind them in case they forget things. Karen says she's prompt. I'm sorry, she's primarily at home during the day and sits in a recliner until her care partner gets off work and transfers her back to her wheelchair. She frequently misses package deliveries or visitors at the door because she's unable to see who it is and doesn't always feel safe answering the door when she's home alone. Which tech tools can help Karen increase her confidence, her safety, and her independence? I know these well. I have them at my house. <laughs> um, uh, they have, first off, we can have security cameras, um, which can help her see what's going on. There are doorbells that um, she can have access to on her phone or even her television um, to come up so that she could have view, she could interact with the person at the door. Um, and if it's a friend or a caregiver coming over, she has the ability to unlock her door if she gets a uh, different type of uh, automatic lock or a keypad. Um, and there's also automatic door openers too that she can again control from her phone. So it gives you a, a lot more security, safety, and a lot more independence with being able to interact getting in and out of the home. You mentioned a few moments ago about in-home services that are available for people with more advanced mobility issues, more complex needs. Can you talk us through that home evaluation process? Sure. So as I was, as I was saying, I work in an outpatient setting, but I do have the ability to go into the home and do an assessment. Um, when I would do an assessment, it would be pretty detailed as far as um, I, I like to make sure that we've covered all our bases in case there's future, future needs. So for instance, measuring um, the grade of maybe a ramp or a sidewalk getting into the home. Are there steps? How high are the steps? Measuring door widths, um, pathways, and then throughout kind of assessing with the patient, um, having them show me where they have trouble areas. Um, maybe um, I've had issues where in the past it was easier to move, even change positions of rooms, move a dining room to a living room so that we'd give them better access to flow through the home, make it more open. Um, big big uh, areas of difficulty are bathrooms and kitchens. So, you know, we can certainly give them the options of uh, all, mo a multitude of options. Do we need to think about getting a walk-in shower or a roll-in shower? Or can we make some modifications uh, with equipment that they could still be able to use like a garden tub um, to be, in and it be independent? Um, and then options in the kitchen, because there's different types of counter heights. Um, there's different ways to set things up. Um, I've had uh, people who maybe were in an apartment and weren't able to do a whole kitchen modification, but we were able to get a counter height table that they could kind of move into the kitchen that they easily could access and then be able to um, still participate in cooking activities. So it really depends on the person, but there are plenty of options. And are there any qualifications or criteria that someone needs to meet prior to arranging for this kind of a detailed assessment? Um, not necessarily. Um, we want to make sure that, that um, they get an assessment. Um, if the home health therapist were to do that, they could go straight into the home, do an assessment right there, and then begin doing home evaluation. Um, if, uh, if they're looking to not, they don't need criteria, need a specific criteria, but when you're thinking about getting modifications, you want to make sure that they're getting um, a qualified uh, contractor or um, someone that's very familiar with ADA accommodations so that they'll be, be getting set up with the proper uh, devices. And I always uh, would encourage people to meet with their therapists first, because oftentimes we'll go into a home and the and they had thought they'd done the right thing to get this bathroom modification by getting a seat built in, but then into a shower, but then maybe the seat was too short or the grab bars weren't placed in the right place. So it's always a good idea to check with the therapist first. 
Andre says he's living with progressive MS and he uses a power wheelchair when he's out running errands, but he finds it difficult to get around his older home in that power wheelchair. What suggestions do you have for Andre? That is a tough one. Um, a lot of older homes might have narrower doorways, narrower hallways. Um, and so when a person is prescribed a wheelchair, actually a vendor should go to the house and see if they can get around in it. Um, if he's moved to this new location too, um, it's, it's time to have it, somebody come in and look again and see if there's some answers to that. Uh, there is potential to do simple widening of doorways just by using something called an offset hinge. Um, and it can give you one to two more inches to be able to get clearance there. Um, but again, if, if it's an older home with tighter hallways, it might be consideration to do some modifications. And so some measurements can be taken and, and um, examples of how things could be improved would be a good idea. Eric tells us he uses a mobility device and he has difficulty in and around closets and small spaces, especially when it comes to opening and closing the doors. Mm. Which home modifications might benefit Eric? That's, that's what we like to give options. So of course, um, is it an option to maybe be able to take the closet doors off completely? Um, can he uh, put a curtain up instead for privacy and it would just make it easier to go in and out? Um, are the shelf heights at a good spot for him so that he can reach things easily? Uh, or if that's not an option, maybe giving him a piece of equipment that has a hook on the end of it so that he would be able to um, get hangers off that are up high. And sometimes it's an option to maybe get a different piece of furniture to hold some of the items that they have in their closet or shoes or things like that. Um, either a skinny kind of dresser so that they can get up right beside it or uh, cubes, furniture with cubes. And you can push those little baskets in, make it really easy to um, be able to get access to the clothing and things like that. Juanita has been living in her home for over 30 years. She says between aging and her MS, she's finding it increasingly difficult to climb the four stairs outside her front door. Juanita's worried she may fall at some point and is wondering whether there are options that'll make the entrance to her home a little more accessible now that her needs have changed. There are different types. Um, the first thing we would want to look at is, is if she is able to do the stairs, are there adequate stair rails? And we recommend two on each side. If that's not really going to be an option, um, we might look and we're always thinking of the most economical <laughs> option first. Um, are there other access uh, ways to access the home that might be more easily modified? Because four steps can be a lot. Um, otherwise, we can um, talk about the elevator or a wheelchair lift. Um, that actually is attached right outside the stair staircase um, that they would be able to pull their chair onto, lift themselves up, and get in and out of the home more easily. Many people who might otherwise benefit from them are concerned about the costs associated with accessibility modifications. Mm -hmm. Does insurance cover these kinds of modifications? It really depends on the patient's plan um, as to what their insurance is. And it's always a good idea to follow up and just see if that's a possibility. Um, other than that, there's, there are definitely uh, grants and, uh, and assistance through the National MS Society. If you contact the navigator, um, they can help you uh, steer you in the right direction if there are grants or um, scholarship programs to be able to help pay for those modifications. Um, I've had patients uh, had good luck with getting in the community, reaching out to their church, their family, their friends, um, or even posting a GoFundMe <laughs> to get um, funds to be able to make some of the modifications. But check with the insurance first. That's a good idea. Tamara says she's interested in a home evaluation, but she lives in a rural area and isn't sure how to find an occupational therapist who understands MS. What suggestions do you have for Tamara? Um, through our comprehensive care center, we definitely have a lot of resources out there. So first try your neurologist and see if they have any recommendations for the area. Um, a social work, social worker can be really helpful in that as well as trying to find, find someone. And um, if you are able to look online, 
There are specialists. They're listed on the National MS Society website. Um, for instance, myself, I'm a, a certified MS specialist. And um, through the consortium of MS centers, they have listing of all the MS specialists in the area, in your area as well. Are there other professionals besides occupational therapists who can provide home evaluation or consultation services that are going to be covered by insurance? Um, potentially, yes. <laughs> there's occupational therapists, there's physical therapists. There are um, some companies that are very well adapted to ADA requirements, and they will advertise that as such. So um, you can contact them and make sure that they're they're explaining exactly why they're needing to put things in the, the, a certain way. For instance, the big one is uh, doorway widths and ramp um, inclines have to be a certain way, especially for if you're using a power wheelchair, you don't want to be going up a steep grade. So um, yes, I would look for people in the um, construction industry that have um, familiarity with their ADA requirements. Daisy tells us that she had a home evaluation. She's already confirmed that her insurance will cover her needs. Stacy says she's ready to have the work done, but she's struggling to find a reliable professional to do the work. Are there any databases or services available to help Stacy find the right professional? Um, you can do a search for ADA design, um, and you'll have quite a few options that'll come up. There is an agency that can help, again, steer you in that direction. It'll have a list of contractors in the area. Um, to help you. Uh, it is it is tough, um, especially when there's a lot of construction going on and um, the, it is a very specialized field. So, um, but it's worth it because you really want to make sure you get someone who knows what they're doing. Cody is asking, what are some of the important questions he can ask when he calls different companies to make sure they're first reputable and also able to handle his home modifications? Right. Um, perhaps ask for references, um, be able to ask for other uh, or uh, pictures or um, of their previous work. Um, again, really uh, ask them who, who they are involved with, if they're involved with any agencies as well that um, you could look into. But I agree, you do need to do your homework. Well, thank you for sharing some really helpful information with us today. What would you say are the top three takeaways that you'd like our viewers to remember? Um, that there are definitely different ways and different accommodations and different strategies, and different equipment that can keep you in your home or keep you, keep you as independent as possible so you can stay where you're at. Um, I think another thing is don't be afraid to reach out. Um, uh, like we mentioned earlier, somebody with maybe a mild symptoms doesn't feel like they need rehabilitation, but it's things like these uh, questions, like how can I be more independent in my home? How can I um, button my shirts more easily? Um, how can I answer the door <laughs> when I'm too tired to get up out of my chair? All those things can be really helpful. So don't be afraid to reach out to them as well. Um, my third takeaway. Um, that's a tough one. I might have just two. <laughs> It's all about quality, not quantity, not I, a problem. There you go. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone who submitted some excellent questions. And thank you, Tracy, for joining us today. Great. Thank you. Before we close, I want to remind you that the National MS Society's MS Navigator team is your best partner when it comes to connecting you to the very best information and resources on living with MS. You can reach an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the Society's website by chat. For information and resources on multiple sclerosis, please be sure to visit the Society's website. You'll find research updates and news, information on connection programs like self-help groups. You'll hear about ways that you can get involved, and you'll find out about upcoming events that are taking place near you. And remember, you can connect with the National MS Society and others affected by MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And I hope you'll join me every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, where I continue the conversation that we start here. 
You'll find Real Talk MS at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I'd like to thank Tracy for joining us today. Please remember that a recording of this webcast will be available at the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. I hope you'll join us at this same time for next week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. You can always find our upcoming program topics on the National MS Society's website. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webcast is important. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to a survey pinned to the comments section. On YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. And on Twitch, you can find that link in the chat. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve, and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take a minute to fill it out. On behalf of Tracy Carrasco and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.